Uh, this one is um, a project that uh, was um, implemented by my unit in GTAC, which is Institutional Development Support. And it has been, it's support that has been provided to the Buffalo City uh, municipality over five years, which is a, a, a sort of an anomaly in our line of work. We normally have projects, projects that can last up to uh, a year, year and a half, but five years was a first. And we have learned many lessons that we will try and share with you on that. Uh, just want to uh, introduce our speaker. Maybe you want to put your uh, camera on, Andrew. Uh, Andrew has worked for the past 25 years in policy research and public sector reform. Uh, you can see on the screen the rest of his uh, very, very short bio. It doesn't do any uh, service to Andrew. Uh, I just want to say, on top of all of this, he's a master at uh, program management, a master at project management, and definitely a master at stakeholder engagement. Um, you can see he's in his car. I know he's on his way. He's on his way from um, somewhere in Pumalanga to the Mbombela Airport. Um, am I right? No, that that was cancelled. I'm actually in Queensland. Uh, <laughs> okay. uh, yes, but uh, also right. on the move. Thanks. Okay. Just hope you're not driving. Yes. No. 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 I'm. I'm definitely stationary for the hour and uh, okay. already. Okay. Yeah, All right. So, so we can yeah. dispense you from the the camera. Um, I just want to introduce uh, some of the people who worked on this project, this five-year project. So there's Sibongile Nkosi, who is in the room, and who is our Eastern Cape Regional Office Manager and uh, invaluable project support on, on this one. Uh, she was absolutely instrumental in managing that uh, project, which was more like a program in nature. Uh, we had Claudia beck Reinhardt, who was the sort of overall project manager, who was invited, but I don't see her in the room as yet. If she does come in, I uh, will let her say a few words. We also had an engineer, De Jamie De Jager, who's, uh, who's uh, now a GTAC long-term LTA, who has worked on this one. And I see that we have colleagues from BCMM here. Um, I recognize Sopna uh, Kumar Nair. Um, if I do not recognize others, please uh, forgive me. So this is uh, a, a webinar about the lessons, mainly about the lessons learned from this project. Um, because it was a very unusual project. It was a, it was, uh, we were present in the municipality for five years and we did something that we don't normally do in my unit. We used a gap filling approach. So we actually put someone there in the, in the municipality and that someone was Andrew. And <clears throat> through his presence, uh, we played quite a strategic uh, and lead role in the municipality at all level, administrative and political, political levels in the, during those five years. So we have played the role of an intermediary, which was quite a shift from our usual approach. Uh, and it has also uh, allowed us to reflect on on the value of supporting projects uh, or clients on a long-term basis. I have, we, we, we spent many hours uh, trying to see if we have had built capacity uh, and if we had had a, a long-term effect uh, that would be more visible 
and tangible than the normal sort of quick in and out uh, approach that we, we have. So I will leave now the floor to, to Andrew to present. And when we move to the questions and answers, I would just like you to introduce yourself and the, the organization you come from before you ask your question. That would be much appreciated. I also want to recognize Ronette Engela, our uh, acting head of GTAC, who is in the room, and she is the brain behind this uh, webinar series. Welcome, Ronette. Um, Andrew? Uh, thanks very much, uh, Emmanuel, and uh, greetings to to all participants um, from GTEC, um, others, stakeholders, and uh, yeah, special hi to, to Sopna. Um, so just to, to go through, I think what would be most useful, uh, Emmanuel, I'll just present, I think, um, the closure report. Um, because I think it kind of gives a good sense of what we tried to do and uh, some of the achievements and some of the challenges. And as I'm talking and presenting, I think I'll reflect um, on some of the issues you raising and perhaps at the end come back to that in terms of, um, you know, looking at what was done as a, as a, let's say, as a model of uh, technical support. So I think what I'll do, I'll just quickly flat uh, the presentation, if that's okay. Um, yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, Thank I'm you very gonna much. I'm just going to put that up. So I think it's this one here. Okay, so, so just in terms, and I'm assuming you can all see this, it's on the screen. We can see. Thank okay, you. Okay. So just in terms of, of what we're doing here today, it's really just reflecting on what we what we got up to in Buffalo City. Um, the, 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 the broad scope was on institutionalizing the Metro Growth and Development Strategy. So just before um, Buffalo City was approached, I mean, GTAC was approached by Buffalo City for technical support the city had uh, undertaken a fairly comprehensive uh, stakeholder engagement process to develop uh, the metro growth and development strategy. So at a high level, the strategy was in place. Um, and then we were brought in as Buffalo City to come in and uh, provide uh, technical support to institutionalize and uh, I suppose ensure that the uh, intent of the MGDS across the different pillars was in fact implemented. Um, and, you know, obviously you don't pick who you work with. Um, so, you know, we had to kind of assume a lot going into that uh, uh, project. Um, but as it turned out, uh, the, dep who, the person who was the deputy mayor at the time of developing the MGDS became uh, the executive mayor. Um, the uh, executive mayor who was part of the deliberations of bringing GTEC on board, he became the speaker. So he was still part of the uh, uh, part of the uh, 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 institution. I think which helped a lot. So there was a lot of continuity there going from the one uh, regime to the next, as it were, when just before we came in. Um, and then they appointed the city manager almost at the same time as we started. Um, they appointed a new city manager. So the city manager was also getting to know the uh, institution at exactly the same time as we were starting our particular project. Um, so I think those were all kind of quite fortuitous in a sense um, and uh, definitely helped from, you know, all kind of moving um, together as it were. We didn't have a lot of resistance, if I can say that, to coming in and getting on and, and doing the work. Even when we did the diagnostic and uh, I mean, the diagnostic is out there for those who want to read it. It's, you know, we, we it's a kind of, um, you know, 
Uh, we didn't hold back on any of the issues that we found. Um, so, you know, it was a real kind of exposure of uh, everything good and bad and ugly in the, in the institution. And uh, it definitely didn't, uh, you know, we didn't get any pushback. In fact, I think the, the leadership really embraced it um, and was quite open to um, accept the criticisms that we leveled at them. Um, so I think just in terms of, of some of those baseline conditions that we found, and I think it was a really important uh, piece of work, the diagnostic. We put quite a big team in place, Emmanuel. I know you and Lindy were quite key in terms of putting that team together. I remember Jeets, Daresh, uh, Claudia, and others were involved in that. Um, but just some of the, the findings, and we, and we didn't rush it. It was a kind of six-month process where we kind of, you know, really, it was almost a kind of um, very participatory process, if I can say that. So all the way through the diagnostic, we were sharing the results, um, engaging with um, with the different uh, senior management team and with uh, with uh, uh, counselors, particularly the, the the mayoral committee, who we worked a lot with at this, you know, in the in the process of developing the diagnostic. But I think what what we generally found in the diagnostic, you know, the the city had been through a period of extreme political instability that you know there'd never been a city manager that finished a term i don't think there'd ever been a mayor that finished the term so buffalo city was really like the worst of the worst if i can say that in terms of institutional stability it represented everything bad about uh, local government um, um and you know a lot of of mistrust um, you know, terrible political admin interface. Um, you know, everybody really nervous about uh, what they say. In fact, in the diagnostic, it was quite difficult to extract information from people because uh, everybody thought whatever they said would be used against them. So, so that was the kind of uh, 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 administration that we found. Um, everybody was in their little uh, cocoons, if I can say that you know, doing their thing. A lot of people had kind of given up almost. So particularly your better technical professionals, they were just kind of, yeah, we do what we do. We get paid at the end of the month, but don't expect, uh, you know, there, there's a lot of negativity, I must say. Don't expect what you're doing here to, 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 to deliver any results. Uh, that was the general message we got. I think there was a, 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 a strong... Um, view from other technical partners like CSP and others. I'm sure maybe there's colleagues from CSP here in the session. Sorry, you know, sorry, Andrew. CSP stands for City Support Program, a program of National Treasury. Yes, sorry. the City Support <laughs> Program. I tried to so, decipher acronyms as a hobby <laughs> Okay, now. great. Th thanks for that, Emmanuel. So, so uh, programs that had come in to support the city, and that's free support, um, in our case, the city was buying the support through GTEC, so a little bit of a different kind of model, if I can say that. But the free support that had been given through a city support uh, program and they bought in World Bank earlier, et cetera, et cetera, you know, very difficult to work with officials, you know, poor attendance, et cetera, et cetera. And I think a lot of frustration uh, when we met with the CSP colleagues, like the city doesn't, we're offering the, the support, they don't want the support. A lot of talk talk about grants being cut, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then just the kind of objective situation, you know, the city had been through a long process of deindustrialization. We know kind of manufacturing employment in particular had halved over the last 20 years, very much a shift from a manufacturing type economy to a services economy, unemployment on the rise. But I think the thing that worried us most when we came in, there didn't seem to be a plan from the, from the city on how to deal with that. There was no economic strategy in place. What was called economic development, and it had shifted from LED to economic development in agencies before we came in. That was part of becoming a metro approach. But they still didn't have a clear strategy. They still were running kind of small LED projects uh, here and there. 
um, actually almost implementing those projects. So much more about direct delivery of a few small projects rather than about, you know, trying to, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, cause things to happen in the e economic ecosystem as a whole in the in the city. Um, obviously, the revenue sustainability risk investment had been on the decline. We did all the building plan and investment analysis as part of the uh, 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 diagnostic. So you can see that the the slump from about 2014 going down. Um, and, uh, you know, the growing indigent population vis-a-vis -vis rate pays, that's actually got a lot worse now. I'll speak to that. But that trend was already um, uh, uh, evident. And look, you probably could have taken any municipality and you would have found a lot of these same evident trends uh, tied in broadly with uh, the economic stagnation in the country from about 2012. So a lot of what's going on in municipalities and going on in Buffalo City is tied to the bigger picture and not to also mention, you know, state capture, corruption and all of that, which probably expressed in Buffalo City as kind of um, antagonism towards professionals um, and definitely, you know, antagonism towards, let's call it evidence-based, plan-led development, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so when we came in, we said, look, the MGDS looks great as an overarching kind of long-term vision. Stakeholders are on board, but your IDP, your SD BIP, um, your budget don't speak to that MGDS at all. So that was a big issue that we, we thought we had to deal with. And then, they, you know, they weren't doing the basics. Look, they're still not doing the basics very well. I'll talk to that. But at, the, at that time... You know, waste wasn't being picked up on time every day, illegal dumps. The city was really, it looked like it was deteriorating fast. Um, and you had a lot of kind of uh, citizen dissatisfaction, uh, particularly around municipal services, which didn't have a head of department and which was uh, going down fast. Um, and then the other issues was around the structure. So we did, you know, we did the kind of McKinsey strategy, structure, skills, et cetera, et cetera, sustainability, that kind of diagnostic. On the structure, again, the structure didn't talk to the strategy. And they had, I think I can't remember what it is offhand, but they had a, you know, a structure of like um, uh, 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 14,000 or 13,000 people whereas they could only afford, you know, three or 4,000 people. So you had a kind of a structure where, you know, everybody put in what they wanted and that became the organogram of the, of the organization. So at any given time, you know, most of the posts were unfilled and you didn't know which was a, a, a key post and which wasn't. So there was a lot of work that had to be done around that. And then lastly, this the, a culture of, of non-accountability, impunity, and a lot of that was linked to political patronage, you know, certain people being untouchable or perceived to be untouchable, a lot of the officials being political, act, you know, political appointees or, you know, high-level high people within the governing party th themselves being appointed in the administration. Uh, in fact, often... Uh, senior to the people who they account to, and and that went down even into the administration. Um, so a lot of blurred and confusing lines of accountability, which we laid bare in our diagnostic, um, but also you know the lack of performance management uh, 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 sanctions, uh, et cetera, et cetera, and then underspending. There was a really poor. I think that's where people from Treasury always come and talk to that. You know, the real poor take up of grants um, and uh, in fact, uh, always this thing of grants being cut or taken away because of the inability to spend and then uh, the value for money, which I'll come back to. I think that's something we try to pay attention to um, looking at value for money. It's not something we managed to do by the end of our, our term, but I'll, I'll get to that. Um, and then you had this thing called the EPMO. So Sopner is from the EPMO. Um, but at the time, you had a previous city manager um, who, um, who, who I think 
you know, came probably in his own way to the same conclusion that I'm coming to now in terms of this presentation of what existed in 2017. Um, but he took a slightly different tack. He said, look, we're going to drive most things through an EPMO. He put a kind of crack team in place in that EPMO in the city manager's office and almost kind of ran a, a parallel delivery mechanism within the institution. Um, it got the backs up of everyone, especially the councillors, but also a lot of the administrators and senior managers. And then as soon as he left, uh, that's Andili Fani, as soon as he left the institution, you know, the, the EPMO got kind of uh, 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 severely marginalized, everybody left. So by the time we came in in 2017, there kind of wasn't really an EPMO, but I think the idea of having this kind of specialist uh, vehicle with capability was very appealing to us. Um, and it was definitely appealing to National Treasury because they were kind of wanting and they had in the past run a lot of their support interventions through the, through the EPMO. So what we said is let's kind of resuscitate that EPMO. So we, we agreed with the city, with, this, with, the man, with the mayor, the mayoral committee and senior management on a few key areas of support. The one was the built environment and urban management area. And there it was, you know, supporting a national treasury with uh, the, the built environment performance plan and spatial planning and all of that. Um, and uh, a part of that job was to capacitate the EPMO. And, uh, you know, one of the things I was responsible for was finding somebody to do that. And, and thankfully, Sopna was recruited. And even that, you know, it's a difficult thing. There was a, you know, we had to fight on appointments when we came into the city. And I suppose that's the difference of your kind of model, if you like, uh, 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 Emmanuel. Uh, you know, probably normally your technical advisors would advise, give a report and then leave it there, whether you, whether it gets taken up or not. I think we were kind of in the mix in terms of actually advocating and fighting for the kind of reforms that we thought needed to happen. So even at the level of appointments, you know, where you would get a clearly captured senior manager of HR who's there to ensure certain types of people get appointed um, to, to continue, I suppose, a broad sort of patronage type agenda. Um, and then, you know, you would, you would get pushback to say, uh, you know, we see the, the job specs that you've put together for this particular uh, person that you think needs to be appointed in the EPMO, but uh, professional registration has never been a criteria in the city, you know, um, and then we have to fight for that, you know, because suddenly that would open it up for anybody to be appointed as an urban planning specialist in the EPMO. Um, and we won that one, hence, you know, the, the pool got very limited only to very senior capable professionals. And that allowed somebody like Sopna, who's sitting here today, to actually be appointed and then to take over the reins from us as technical support people, uh, supporting on the spatial planning and the built environment, environment planning and run that herself to the extent that we as GTAC completely pulled back from that area. And I think that's really a kind of, you know, a, a center of excellence now within the institution. But we also looked at the B business process reviews. The city uh, infrastructure delivery management system was coming into play from treasury. So we took that and did a lot of support um, in terms of getting the city geared up for that. Uh, 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 city support program has now taken that over again now that we've left. Um, and part of that was also putting, you know, standard operating procedures. I'll say that when I reflect, we started too late on this piece of work. Um, so I don't think we had the impact that we really wanted to in terms of getting standard operating procedures in place. But we, but we thought, you know, you need to hit it at the strategic level, you know, spatial planning, economic planning, get the strategy right within the city, but then 
take it all the way down to systems, you know, because if the systems are not in place, your strategy is just never going to be implemented. And I think that's something that we found. You've got to work from the bottom up and you've got to work from the top down. You've got to change the mindset of leadership. And a lot of what we did was a very deliberate kind of leadership development approach. So a cooperative leadership approach, trying to get the leadership that's the mayoral committee, the senior management team to actually appreciate that you need to partner up, that you need others to get others involved, that you need technical assistance where it's on offer um, and that you need to, to kind of, um, you know, go beyond just your narrow projects that you're implementing. But as much as it's about kind of getting the top working, if, if I can say that, if you're not building from the bottom up, in terms of getting the systems in place, the business processes, the standard operating procedures, you know, the the the, the top stuff doesn't actually matter because it, your implementation just won't happen. So so that's really the kind of model that we developed over time. And I'll talk to whether the effectiveness of that. So those were the kind of areas on the built environment and urban management. Wasn't always easy, I must say, you know, at the beginning before Sopna and Sia Kakaza, the head of the EPMO were appointed. Um, we used to do the presentations at the, at the Lakhotlas and the mayoral committees and the, to senior management on the spatial, you know, the catalytic programs and all of that. So that's, I think, the kind of gap filling that Emmanuel was talking about because we stepped in and actually did that until such time as there was a team that was in place to take that over to sophisticate it. I mean, Sopna and company did a, did a much better job at it than we did a, a, in the initial stages. But um, but nonetheless, I think we got that ball rolling, if I can say that, and that was our job. And uh, you know, presenting to mayoral committee and presenting especially to council lechotlers. You would get this thing, you no, know, why do we need catalytic programs? Why do we need to focus, for example, on the West Bank? So a lot of what we said, we got behind the biggest investment, which, which was Mercedes-Benz, which over the term turned out to be a kind of about a 16 billion rand, 16.5 billion rand investment that came into the city. That's with the, the supply chain, the, the, the different component suppliers in the, in the IDZ. But a lot of what we did was focus in on the West Bank and get, you know, Transnet, try get the port working, AXA. And a lot of we worked very, very closely with the East London IDZ. As GTAC, we probably worked closer with the IDZ than, than with the city itself in terms of the economic development work we did. Um, but that was to get that. So from the land use planning stuff, you know, through to, you know, the port expansion, we, get, we developed load shedding agreements with, uh, with Mercedes, et cetera. So we just try to get that. And then we had quarterly meetings between Mercedes leadership, the mayor and, uh, and, the, and the city manager and a few key officials every quarter, just to make sure that, that um, the lead into the new, what they call W206 went smoothly. Um, and that was something very new to the city. I think they didn't have a focus. In fact, the West Bank wasn't one of their catalytic programs. They had no focus on kind of Mercedes and the auto sector, even though Buffalo City is an auto city, you know. So we said, yeah, it is an auto city. You do need to diversify, absolutely. But let's not only focus on diversification. Let's also make the automotive work better so we actually get the investment and we get the next model. At the moment, there's a lot of work that has to be done to make sure we've got the model until 2027. And we're talking 25% of the Buffalo City economy. That's what Mercedes brings to the party, Mercedes and the sort of extended value chain. So if Mercedes goes, Buffalo City really kind of not only wobbles, it kind of goes down badly. Um, so we've got to make sure now we get, that's now getting the city ready for EV and uh, a lot of emphasis now on RCT, building the kind of digital hub around Mercedes. That's the stuff we started with Smart City, with World Bank, with, uh, with um, uh, uh, RDZ, et cetera. But uh, just to go quickly through, because I'm going to run out of time, I don't know how you say about 
half the time. So I must, I think I must wrap up soon, Emmanuel. But the second big area was on the NGD yeah. planning and review. So that was getting the planning going uh, 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 pillar by pillar. And then every year we had with the different line departments, we had workshops. Uh, we took it into the Lakhotla. The mayor and the city manager gave us that space to present at every technical Lakhotla, mayoral Lakhotla, council Lakhotla. And so we were able to kind of influence the agenda quite nicely, I think. And, you know, even the way the IDP structured now, it's structured according to the different pillars. I think you can definitely see the MGDS very clearly in the in the IDP, in the SDBIP, and even in the budget, but probably less so in the budget. I'll come to that. Revenue management, we did a particular, uh, Duresh did a particular study on revenue. There was a lot of issues on revenue, especially with COVID. Look, when COVID hit, we, we, we had to have a special support around, you know, getting the re city ready for COVID. We gave them updated reports all the time coming from national, obviously all the intelligence networks that we linked into on, uh, on uh, 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 you know, the, the, the scenarios that present. We obviously influenced risk and, uh, and uh, you know, we worked a lot on the, the kind of strategic risk side. So feeding into the risk register every year, but particularly with the COVID stuff. And I think stop them doing some kind of nonsense stuff like building their own uh, hospitals. I know we teamed up there with National Treasury. We were also, you know, dead set against them uh, getting involved in health, health operations, et cetera. Um, and then we also, which came in, in, and I think that was the beauty, if I can say that, Emmanuel, of having a long-term kind of a partnership with them or, you know, technical uh, uh, support uh, 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 partnership. Because as things came at them, like COVID, we could then kind of tailor support around COVID. Or, you know, um, I think that, and especially coming out of COVID with a shift to digitalization, uh, we got a lot onto the smart city, you know, with, uh, with CSP, with the World Bank team that came in. And a lot of what we did, look, we had a good World Bank team supporting the city on, on uh, uh, smart, the smart city work. Um, our job was really to make sure, you know, every meeting, make sure the officials are there. And that's, I did a lot of that, you know, before a meeting, I would, I would personally phone people, chase people, are you there, you know, after meetings. And, uh, you know, it, it's unfortunate that that kind of, you know, we call it a sort of intermediary role. That uh, that that uh, maybe it reflects on leadership there, etc. That that doesn't just happen automatically. I even found now with the water crisis, you know, I'm a citizen here in Buffalo City. You know, with the water crisis, you know, we were just, you know, filthy water was coming out of our taps. We were without water for days. Everyone knew there was a crisis, but we also knew from the kind of links we have into the city. That the, that the Buffalo City Water Engineering Department, Amatolia Water, you know, and uh, Water and Sanitation had not met to actually engage on these issues, you know. And I think that's the role we played. I still play that role now on a voluntary basis just because I'm self-interested in getting, you know, water coming out of the tap. But just to kind of pull people together around a table, say, this is a problem. How do we tackle that problem? Um, so I think very much that I know they call that sort of that problem driven iterative planning type approach, the PDI stuff. Hello, I, think, I think we were very much kind of trying to do that without probably being explicit about that. Yes. But as as problems came, you know, trying to tackle those problems with the different officials, the investment the support. I'm sorry, Andrew, can uh, I think it's Tabiso Tebe and Vivek, uh, can you please mute yourself? <laughs> uh, sorry, Andrew. Okay, no problem. Okay, there's somebody else so, now with their microphone Sunday, on. Tabiso Tebe, thank you. And then there was another lady to Manuel, it's Nick yes, speaking. Yes. I can mute all of them and then Andrew, just unmute yourself again. that thanks Ronette 
Andrew, you can just unmute yourself and go ahead. Sorry for that. Okay, I'm back on. I'm just yeah, going to Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, I'm back again and I'm uh, from current slide. Okay, so so then, you know, also on the investment side of things, so, you know, we started off with an in de developing an investment plan. Again, we, we did that in a very participatory way. So we did kind of round tables with business in the different sectors. I think a lot of it, you know, you've got whatever it is, like a lot of, I don't know if it's suspicion or whatever, but you don't have, you didn't have a healthy relationship between leadership and business and industry leadership in the city. So I think a lot of what we tried to do was just to facilitate sessions between industry leadership and officials from the department uh, or from EDA, from the department, but also bringing in the mayor, the city manager, the agency, the IDZ, and then also we brought in a national and, and you know, DTRC and other players into the mix. So we had like round tables in different sectors, understanding what the constraints are, and then trying to put measures in place to address those in a kind of collaborative way. So I think a, a strong theme, if I can say that, Emmanuel, would be the, the kind of theme of building collaborative leadership. That's not something you can do quickly. It's not something you can do in a you know in a in a normal kind of GTAC come and do a diagnostic you know present the findings and and go away it's something that you kind of stick with some of it we didn't always succeed public employment programs you know we developed I thought quite you know really good public employment programs again that's at the design level with Harambi with Papesa you know with different NGOs you know, with, uh, you know, Kate and her team there in the presidency. But then you got to get those things implemented. Not always easy. They come back into the city administration. There's often, you know, bottlenecks. So we, and then no accountability when things don't get implemented. So I think accountability was a huge issue for us. Um, and then on the waste stuff, we did a lot of kind of, you know, the root cause stuff. So a lot of that workshopping, problem diagnostics, and then trying to get the officials to identify how to solve those. And then, yeah, we'll come up with something which we call a service delivery improvement plan. And obviously everything we did, we had to have kind of deliverables. And, you know, I always had Spongili on my, on my case, which is great. You know, I'm not, uh, uh, put, I'm not saying that negatively, Spongili. It's great. You, I think you played an absolutely critical role in the project, you know, but all the work we're doing, Let's have something called the service delivery improvement plan. But then it doesn't ever get implemented, you know. Then we'll take that back to mayoral. We say, look, we've developed a nice plan, hasn't been implemented. So a lot of it is about, was about that, you know, breakdown of accountability, which we battled a lot with. But just some of the big highlights, I think if you speak to people like Jan, I don't know if Jan's part of this session, but Jan always says, okay, at the, now he can see that at least this, the city thinks like a metro and I think we played a, a, a definitely played a key role in getting the city to actually think like a metro. They don't behave like a metro yet, but they think like a metro. The behavior still got to come. That's work in progress. There's definitely a good spatial economic logic, which I think we started with the catalytic programs, et cetera. But I think it's now that's run, you know, the EPMO, SOPNA, SIA, they've got that stuff in hand. It's, it's, it's running like clockwork, that stuff. I think the EPMO is definitely one of the, you know, it's, it's a center of excellence within the institution. We just have to make sure we protect it. Well, we're not there anymore, but, uh, you know, from a national treasury perspective, make sure the EPMO gets protected. It's a different model as well. It's not trying to deliver things on the side like the old model. It's now properly, you know, embedded in the institution. We left the city with a clear plan, the economic recovery and investment plan with different pillars, lots of actions, different stakeholders on board. Uh, and I think importantly, the, the border car chamber, we worked a lot with the chamber. 
when we started, there was a lot of hostility between the city and the chamber. Now, you, if you go, the chamber's got its own working groups, what they call working groups or work streams. They meet every couple of weeks. In every work stream now, officials from the Buffalo City participate in those. Either the deputy mayor or one of the mayoral uh, councillors will be part of those uh, work, work streams. That's on waste, you know, a work stream on uh, 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 smart city and IT, you know, a work stream on investment. So in each of these work streams that the chamber runs, the city now participates. So I think that's, you know, those are kind of what we would call kind of broad communities of practice that I think we really contributed to establishing. Those things are in place now and, uh, uh, you know, can definitely help take the city forward. As I've already spoken to the Mercedes-Benz investment, you know, I became known as like the, almost like, a, 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 I know you always said I was, some people said I was like an embedded person for National Treasury. You know, I always had that identity crisis. Who do I actually work for? Do I work for National Treasury? Am I a National Treasury kind of plant or pimpy in the city? Do I work for the city? Am I a city like plant in National Treasury? Other people thought I worked for Mercedes-Benz, actually, and I was a Mercedes-Benz representative or a big business kind of, you know, a, a plant in the city, et cetera, et cetera. So I did, I must say, there's a lot of identity crisis stuff going on, but I think that was, you know, that's just the space that we occupied as the sort of intermediary. Uh, but I think ultimately we did kind of enjoy trust of business, of labor, definitely, you know, we had a lot of sessions also with Samu. We try to get a a, 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 a a change management process going with the unions. So we did have, we had the unions on board. We had business in the city on board. We had the leadership in the city on board. So we did have the kind of key players backing us. I don't think anyone went for us or thought we were, you know, driving any kind of agendas or anything like that. We did a lot of the interfacing with national, you know, like uh, particularly the Ports Authority. That was the mayor's hobby horse. I see now TNPA just released their couple of billion rand investment in the port. That's after 50 years of not investing in Buffalo City Port. And Mercedes always, almost wanting to pull out because of the port constraints. So I think that's a big victory for, for us, uh, Emmanuel, in terms of, I mean, the role we played. So I would mm. facilitate sessions with Transnet, with the city, you know, with other players. We would facilitate that. You would have the head of TNPA in those sessions, but we would do the facilitative role in those sessions. And I think the city understands its weaknesses. They haven't done, I won't go into all the SOPs. You'll see there at the end of our term, the city, the, city, uh, uh, the executive mayor kind of talks about a social compact if you read that in the compact are all the areas that we identified and we've been pushing. So I think in terms of embedding the agenda, it's definitely there, um, but there's a lot of partnerships that still need to happen. So safety and security, a big one. Um, you know, the city employed everyone, all these MK veterans in the last term and, 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 and kicked out the outsourced uh, you know, companies. And I think since then, all the assets were continually being vandalized, stripped, et cetera. That's still a big issue. We try to get that reversed. We didn't win that with council. So a lot of what we did didn't always work. You know, we'd propose things, they would be taken to council and council would reject it for whatever reason on political grounds, et cetera. Um, I think a lot of the partnerships going forward, <clears throat> particularly around energy, triple P's around amenities and facilities and management. Those also open up cans of worms in terms of, you know, corruption risks and things like that. So those are things that we're going to have to manage carefully going forward as we move into new, you know, property management, those kinds of, 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 of partnerships. Look, we ended with what we call the fault lines that we were unable to resolve properly. So I think the city is still failing on the basics the crime and grime, not putting enough into the into uh, infrastructure maintenance, water and sanitation, at least now I see this year, they've got a big pumped up budget for that. <clears throat> so that's great. 
rising administered costs we fought with, even with National Treasury on this one, not putting enough pressure on the city to keep um, uh, 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 tariff increases in check, rates right? and tariff increases. This year, they kept it very much in check. Business is very happy this year. But in previous years, you know, it was always inflation plus three, plus four, plus five. And the problem is if you're doing that, you've got to show value for money. And business was getting very frustrated that we're getting these big increases, but actually in the industrial park of Wilsonia, potholes are increasing, outages are increasing, although we didn't manage to negotiate load shedding agreements for industry, et cetera, et cetera. But I think that thing, if you are increasing rates and tariffs, you've got to show value for money. We also pushed for some um, rate cuts for industry, which we won for certain like for Defy, we managed to get a rates cut. I know some other colleagues in National Treasury weren't always happy with us for that, but that was part of the investment work we were doing there. Um, and then on, on, on uh, budget prioritization, big issue going forward. You know, that's something we pushed hard, but never quite won <clears throat> that thing of, uh, of a prioritization matrix. That's probably the area where there's most resistance, if I can say that, within municipalities or within any state entity, you know, when you come in and start really trying to influence budgets and budget decisions. Um, so that was an area we got a lot of pushback from. Um, and then obviously data integrity, you know, still a mess, a lot of automated systems being put in place now <clears throat> with a smart city. So hopefully we can fix that. Um, uh, I won't go through much. I've spoken to that. But I think the PMDS, look, they've got a PMDS performance system. People, managers sign performance agreements, but not implemented. So no one's held accountable. There were a few cases where there were uh, attempts to hold people accountable and you got pushback, you know, council intervening, etc. So a lot of, you know, and I think that's something that we have to really grapple with. Um, and uh, one of the other big areas that we, we were confronted with was uh, the HODs are permanently employed. So, you know, lack of performance management, not holding HODs to account um, and uh, not being able to replace HODs uh, and HODs having this kind of comfort that they're there for life. I think that was the 2012 um, agreement when um, I can't remember who the minister was, but it was in President Zuma's years where they said, you know, municipalities can decide where their heads of departments are appointed on sh on fixed term or 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 full time permanent basis. And Buffalo City took the decision to appoint on a permanent basis. Um, look, when we came in, there weren't uh, HODs in place. So at least there are HODs now in all departments. Um, but uh, uh, they're not necessarily the most competent HODs and very difficult to, to bring in new blood. So that's a big issue that is not going to change. At the end, we did a sort of institutional institutionalization matrix, which we looked at how, <clears throat> sorry, I'm just having a sip of water. We looked at how our support can be fully institutionalized, you know, different HODs, different uh, uh, entities within the institution taking up the reins of the work we're doing, and we had sort of hand hand holding exercises to take over. And just lastly, Emmanuel, some of the lessons. I think, look, um, we were all over ambitious. We thought, you know, we would put the city on a five percent growth trajectory, et cetera, et cetera. At the end, especially with COVID, it became about look how do we how do we slow down the pace of regression? I mean that's how we were talking, rather than about being over ambitious. So it became more about resilience than about you know come you know turning the city into this kind of high growth, you know inclusive, you know uh, uh, high investment kind of uh, destination. So, so uh, we, we kind of played down our expectations quite fast, especially on the, on like the, 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 the standard operating procedures, 
when we did the, the diagnostic of that, we didn't do that in our initial diagnostic. We did that when we started the business process review and standard operating procedure uh, process. And we, when we went in, we realized that the, the SOPs were way worse. In fact, mostly weren't there. So it was a kind of start from scratch with 18 months to go in the project. And I think, you know, the big lesson, we should have started with that, the bottom up stuff, you know, and then the top down stuff would have worked better. So that was a big lesson for us, I think. Um, uh, and then. Um, and yeah, so, uh, Andrew, you, you really need to wrap up. So okay, where we were located, we didn't have a home necessarily. We were in the city manager's office, I think, but particularly on some of the projects, you know, they needed uh, drivers, so if, particularly the CM, DMS stuff. I think let me kind of, I've said a lot of that. Just where we thought at the end, we interviewed Jan. Jan put the city in the middle of the metros. And it was just before the election. So I think it was News 24 had the out of order index put Buffalo City at about number five. So we're probably around that. We're the fifth most expensive city to do business in. But because there's so little else on offer, we need to be the cheapest metro to do business in. But maybe we don't have the economy of scale to do that. But definitely those are big concern areas for us going forward. But definitely Mangong at the bottom. Good to see this uh, national step in there. So just in conclusion, I think, you know, a lot of what we did was, you know, try to play that intermediary, intermediary role, build trust build partnerships, build collaborative leadership. And that's a kind of over time thing. It doesn't come quick and easy, but I think we managed to take the city definitely to a different place to where we found it. Um, I think leadership continuity, the, the city manager is now gone. You know, there's a new city manager. Well, it will be advertised. Maybe the city manager comes back. Uh, you know, more likely we get somebody else out as there's new political leadership in place. The mayor's still there, but uh, definitely within the governing party, there's shifts. So, but I think we've, we, before we left, Emmanuel, we had with a new leadership um, and uh, including the new head of the uh, governing party, who was the, who's the deputy mayor, a lot of sessions, a lot of handover, embedding the work we're doing. So I think we will see continuity in the work we've done. <clears throat> and then the question you asking, but maybe we can have that more as a discussion, you know, the value of long term technical support. I mean, look, the work I'm doing, I'm in the <clears throat> advisory space now for one of the ministries. And look, there's a, there's, there are tech, long term technical partnerships with EU, with, you know, World Bank, with UNDP. And I, those things go for three years, four years, five years. I don't think this was very different, Emmanuel, as I see those technical partnerships, you know. The difference is I think we had linkage in with the leadership at political, the mayor, the mayoral committee, and the senior management. We met quarterly with them, with yourself, with um, um, GTAC leadership, with Lindy and company. So we could always have that two-way engagement you know we weren't always successful they didn't implement everything we said definitely not you know because I think even they don't have leadership is not fully in charge of the municipalities just because of the complexity of all the you know ANC politics etc but I think let me stop there but for me you know it was them paying for um, a service at the end of it you know, in terms of the feedback we got, they were very happy for the service we got, uh, for they got. I think we we definitely shifted thinking in the city and definitely um, put some capacity in place in critical places that's still in place now. So, uh, you know, for me, it was uh, successful. It could have been far more successful and impactful. And yes, look, Buffalo City is still, you know, a city that's battling with the basics. You know, it's still got a long way to go to where it needs to be, mm. like, like the other 90% of 
municipalities, including some of our big metros. So municipal space, as I said in, we said in our closeout report, biggest area of concern for the country, you know, things really falling apart there, a complete rethink about technical support models, and uh, and stepping in, and I'm glad National Treasury is stepping in to the place I'm in now. I'm sitting here in Enoch and Kojima in Queenstown, completely falling apart. You know, no electricity, electricity out for three weeks at a time. There's no way you can get any investment in those places. Investment all shifting to the Western Cape, etc. So we're back to a kind of almost a rebound to standardization, if you like, with the investment and skills following capacity and governance. And that's a, a very worrying place to be as a country. Thanks. Thank you very much, Andrew. You can hear that Andrew was the ears and eyes and the heart of this project. Um, one of the strengths of the project was that <clears throat> all the technical people were actually from from Buffalo City, so they had a, a very strong stake in getting the city to work better. I just want to reiterate that um, the I just want to say that the project the, the the success or the relative success of the project was entirely due to the fact that. Uh, people were highly invested in it. They gained the trust of uh, leadership and across um, the hierarchy. And we had developed a really good relationship together with the executive mayor and the city manager. Uh, so, yeah, that, that was it. I would like to now open the floor to, to questions, comments. I'm just going to switch my camera off. And when you come in, just say where you are from, please. Okay. I can see Sopna. Sopna, we spoke about you. We spoke about you uh, during this presentation. Uh, Sopna is part of the EPMO. Um, in the Buffalo City. Uh, oh, Sopna, you come in and I've got Ronette uh, after you. Thanks. Thanks very much, uh, Emmanuel. And thanks, Andrew. I thought I'd come in first because, um, you know, uh, I'm the only one here from the city, I think. There, there might be others. But I just wanted to just, you know, um, um, you know, appreciate having had Andrew with uh, us in the city, at least from the time that I started there um, in 20, early 2018, um, up to the last year. Uh, of course, with COVID, things got a bit different. But um, I just wanted to say, you know, Andrew said he didn't have a, a, a home, as in because he was transversal, but physically he was actually placed in our office, the EPMO. And I, I would say that he... Um, it was a huge benefit for us uh, officials in the EPMO because he was constantly there as a sounding board to um, everything that we did. And um, he, especially in terms of the built environment performance plan, he actually, um, you know, enabled its institutionalization, um, made the linkages for us with the budget office, with the external partners, um, you know, made us look outward um, uh, from out from the city, you know, to our partners like uh, the IDZ and O province and got us the right to contact people from the various spheres of government to get involved. So, um, yeah, it was really great having Andrew and, and Andrew really, um, you know, we might have done the, the technical content for the built environment performance plan, but he he certainly helped us with the, the partnerships part and the embedding at a political level and at, at a at a an administrative level across the various directorates. So yeah, thanks again, Andrew. We really do miss having you here. Um, but you you really left us with a, a quite a strong um, legacy. Thanks very much. Thank you, Sopna. Uh, Ronette? Hi, 
Um, Andrew, thanks, thanks, Emmanuel, and, and thank you for the presentation. It's lovely to listen to somebody who has got such enthusiasm for what you're doing. Something here at the end that you said really interests me, and you were talking about in ref on reflection that the bottom up and um, looking at the standard operating processes around the business, the various business elements um, turned out to be should have would have been quite quite important, and you didn't have enough time to do it in the project. And it's a question in my head is why are we designing so much of our projects without a real deep understanding? And I'm not sure this was the case here, but I often find that people do not deeply understand the business processes in government, that we are we have enormously complicated, overly convoluted mazes of decision making, delegated authority, non-delegated authorities. And there's something that we just like we just don't look at that. It's like that's not sexy to look at. And I think that's actually the real front line of service delivery where we where we will make big changes and impacts. I want you to just reflect a little bit more on, on that, the standard operating procedures. And I know people like to talk big and heavy, sexy talk, and it's not standard operating procedures, but I think there's a big there's a big uh, terrain we need to look at there. Thanks. Thanks, Renette. I saw Jamie's hand. Is that Jamie the Jager? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Jamie was the was the the one who put his uh, finger on on the fact that we had made assumptions about what was in place for the um, infrastructure delivery uh, in the city. And maybe you want to speak to Renette's point? Yeah, when when she put her hand up and started talking, I knew it was going to come up, actually. Um, I, th I think when we started on the standard operating procedures, um, the scope of work was basically embed CIDMS and try and institutionalize CIDMS. Um, I would say more than 95 to 100% of the people had never heard of CIDMS, yet you had to go there and do standard operating procedures against the CIDMS. And, and that was the top-down approach, and, and, and it was very much based on, as I said, the CIDMS, which is portfolio, program, project, operations and maintenance, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But when you sit down and say, well, let's do the ASs and look what standard operating procedures they've got, they had literally next to nothing. Sometimes you might have at a treatment plant a, an operating procedure, um, but there was nothing in the water and sanitation that had a, an, 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 a preventative maintenance standard operating procedure. And when, when we started and we asked them, um, uh, let's see the standard operating procedures and how do you actually function if you don't have them? Um, it, it, it opens up quite a big debate around their understanding about why do we need a standard operating procedure and and what what do we need in it and and quite honestly uh, at the end of the day uh, if we had started at the bottom up um, we would have addressed them in their look they work in silos there's, there's no doubt about it so 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 if you were sitting down and saying I have to do chlorination of a water treatment plant that would be their understanding of a standard operating procedure. Or if I have to do billing um, uh, or, or, or fixing a tap or whatever, that was the level that they wanted standard operating procedures. So the building blocks would have started off with them in their office and how they do their work and build up. Where we were coming in and saying, look, how do you do budgets? And the budgets, they sit down and say, well, it's all done by the CFO's office in the silo office, and they come to us and the budget is done Last year we got 80 million. This year our budget's been cut, so you're only going to get 60 million this year. So why do a standard operating procedure? And then you get a whole political debate around how can we not do a standard operating procedure around how do you do your budget process? So, so, so um, I think I think um, you do you do need a two a two pronged approach: one from the top down and one from the bottom up. But you get buy-in from from the actual units. We, we got a lot more, the level of debate was a lot more healthier when we actually got closer to what are they doing in their office day to day. 
and 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 if we had had lots of time, it would have been nice because we could have then pulled them along with us to you know as you build the pyramid upwards, and then you if you had time, you could start with the the political level and work your way down. Um, I think we would have had a lot more traction, and they would have done a lot more. We we on the bottom up approach, we only literally had six months to do it. But um, uh, the traction we got at that level was, was actually getting very, very healthy and the debates were very, very good. And we actually taught them to do a lot of them themselves. Um, whether they're going to do that is another problem. But yeah, it, it is. A uh, thanks, Jamie, you muted yourself. Uh, but thanks, uh, it is true. What you said is true in terms of the bottom-up and top-down approach. We also know that the municipality wanted us to carry on with specific, specific pieces of work. Uh, we're waiting for them to engage us and see uh, if we can finish this, at least this piece of work on the CID, MS and all the SOPs. Uh, it's just that at the moment there's a bit of a, a leadership uh, issues as as andrew said so i suppose we'll wait for a new city manager to be in place and we can uh, see if we can finish this important piece of work thank you i've got vuyon kosla please come in uh thank you chair um uh, i'm violating kosla from a uh, cocktail acting director i'd like to apologize that I actually got in a bit late. We have issues with our our emails are not working. So I had to try and call Mr. Jolingana to send um, the email on my private email. Um, actually, I uh, wanted to say that, um, please, Mr. Andrew, is it possible that you can share the presentation? And also we've been tasked by the portfolio committee in their findings. They had asked with Didit and COPTA to work together in trying to remodel the local economic development because they're saying that, um, you know, the, the LED strategies that are being done in all the, you know, metros and, and districts and local municipalities, they're not seeing the spin-offs. So I think uh, I would appreciate if I would, uh, you know, get um, your email so that we can write, um, you know, a, a letter so we can sit and perhaps with did it and 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 try you know get advice in terms of uh, what what work can we do together in trying to remodel um you know local economic development within the province thank you All right thank you for you um andrew would you like to reply or comment on some of the questions um no, no. Uh, look, just to thank um, uh, Sopna, and I believe it's uh, it's uh, it's doctor now. Yeah, somebody was telling me. So, it's, uh, oh yes, congratulations. And 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 Voyo, who just spoke now, it's also doctor. So we've got two two, if I'm correct, two two new uh, PhDs, PhDs who've just both spoken, who, who have just graduated in the last uh, uh, month or two. So congrats to both of you who are, who are, who are uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's fantastic to see people in government um, institutions who are, you know, personally kind of growing and, um, you know, not only from a personal growth perspective, but, um, you know, bringing others with you in, in, in your spaces that you, you, you occupy. And I think that's great. I mean, for me, half of it's that, Emmanuel. We just need, I mean, Voyo you and Sopna, you're both good examples. I mean, we just need, if we can attract the brightest people into the public sector, and it's not, it, look, Buffalo City is a tough place to work in. That's the one thing I realized. It's an incredibly tough environment. Those officials, and Jamie, you would uh, have the same experience in the workshops you ran on the SOPs. You know, often what we provided was a release for them to really air, air what's actually going on, the frustrations they have, you know, uh, the fact that nobody takes them seriously. Or and, and I think we worked a lot with that second, third, fourth tier, you know. We started off, yeah, we worked with the city manager and the heads of departments, but you know, as the years passed, I think we worked more and more with the third and fourth tier, actually, as the project progressed. Uh, and maybe a short term project, you wouldn't do that because we, you know, we, we built those networks, we 
we, we almost like developed, like, I suppose it is small communities of practice of officials who actually want to work. And there's loads of them. Buffalo City is full of very enthusiastic, highly capable people, actually. And you kind of look at that and you say, but then why, or, you know, why are the streets dirty? Why is this, why is this not happening? What, you know, so it's, it's hard to kind of marry the two. I think it comes to, to, to Renette's point, you know, about uh, maybe we, none of us are prioritizing the, the, the boring stuff, if you like, you know, and I think that's what Jamie got into. And look, it wasn't part of our original brief, this, the, the business processes and the SOPs. What was part of, as we got into the diagnostic, then we did a built environment diagnostic and the, the built environment diagnostic showed that this was an area we needed to get into. So again, it's that iterative kind of planning approach. If we had just gone in there for six months or a year, we would never have even got to the SOPs, you know. We only got to yeah. the SOPs, but we got to them late, but at least we got to them, Emmanuel, you know. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. I, and I think, uh, as Jamie said, the approach he took was not only to kind of, not to do, but to teach them how to do, you know. And that's why I do believe that we have built some capacity, uh, as uh, Sopna highlighted, and yes. there's still I'm still to find a way of uh, showing evidence of the capacity we have built. Mm -hmm. uh, we still need to reflect on how we we show well, how we find the evidence. Uh, we have about two minutes, and the last uh, hand I will take is that of Sibongile. Kosi, uh, who's our regional manager in Buffalo City. Thank you, Emmanuel. Uh, thank you, colleagues. I just want to say thank you to Andrew for that detailed reflection. I mean, within 55 minutes of work that we've we've undertaken over a five-year period. I mean, that's when we, I joined GTEC. So it's even hard to believe that uh, we completed the project. And it was actually good to be part of a project where GTEC produces a diagnostic report and actually support the client to implement the recommendations. Usually we have limited time to do that or we don't have time. We just produce the diagnostic and leave it with the client. So it was one of those projects that really um, provided a learning curve even for us in terms of our approach. We can learn, I think, going forward um, with implementation of other projects for impactful yes. and you know sustainable um, support that we provide to our clients as the organization. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Jamie. And thank you to Claudia in her absence. Uh, thank you so much, colleagues. Thank you. There's also a thanks to be given to Lee Pernega, who was uh, our local governance uh, advisor on this. Um, I think we've come to the end of the session. Uh, Kaslin, maybe you want to tell us which, uh, what is the webinar next week? I think it might be interesting to tell people right now. Otherwise, I would like to thank all of you for your participation. And uh, I'll see you at the next uh, IDS webinar. Thanks thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thanks Kaslin you. will tell Bye. us. Before you leave, Kaslin will tell us about the next webinar. Thanks, Emmanuel. So next week we have a, a webinar from the uh, PPP and TAS unit, um, and it will be on the project preparation facility. That would be the, the topic for next year. I mean, next week. <laughs> Yeah, this is an important one on uh, how we manage a pipeline of infrastructure projects. Uh, so see you next week. Thank you very much. Thanks, thanks, Emmanuel. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Andrew. Yeah, thanks. thanks also, Emmanuel, for all your support and their guidance and leadership on the project. Great. Yeah.